questions, and I call Robin Newton. Mr. Newton. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker. I wonder, Mr. Speaker, could I ask the minister what actions he is currently taking to uh, improve the survival rates of those who are suffering from heart attacks? Uh, thank the member for the question. There are a number of actions that we are taking to improve survival uh, rates from heart attack. Uh, first of all, my chief medical officer is, is devising a community resuscitation strategy uh, to ensure that people are better equipped to respond uh, where heart attack takes place, and especially where there are defibrillators available that they can make uh, full and uh, best use of defibrillators in a safe uh, way. Uh, and very importantly, we have uh, established uh, PCCI units uh, where on a 24-7 basis. So the Belfast PCCI unit at the Royal Victoria Hospital uh, was launched. Uh, that will cover 75% of Northern Ireland's population and uh, will make a massive difference. Uh, uh, the, the other unit will be in Alton Gelvin and it will be in place in the summertime of next year and will cover all of Northern Ireland and will probably offer a service uh, beyond Northern Ireland as well. Uh, and again, uh, we will have 100% coverage for PCCI. The difference that PCCI can make is absolutely fantastic, and we're looking at a reduced mortality rate of around 2%, uh, which will equate to around uh, 20 people actually living as a result of having the PCCI unit in place. But not only will you have 20 people living, every hour that someone, for every hour that, that after a heart attack that someone uh, lives without having such an intervention, uh, they will be doing damage to their, their heart muscle. Mm. And having the PCCI units in place to respond uh, very, very quickly to the needs of people will ensure that heart muscle uh, isn't damaged and consequently people who suffer from heart attacks uh, and receive uh, PCCI will live considerably longer. Robin Newton. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for that, and indeed that is uh, good news. Uh, I wonder he, he, uh, what was referred to as the cath labs. I wonder if the Minister might comment on how the cath labs might be rolled out across uh, Northern Ireland. We have a series of cath labs, and the, the PCCI unit, the, the cath labs that I was referring to, uh, would be on a 24-7 basis in Belfast and Alton Gelvin hospitals. There will be cath labs available in other parts of Northern Ireland, which will not be on a 24-7 basis. Interesting enough, uh, at, at this, how a cath lab works is a very fine wire is actually uh, pushed through the arteries, uh, <coughs> identify, we identify where the blockage is, and it takes the blockage out. And all it leaves is actually a small mark in, in someone, someone's arm. Um, so it is an intervention uh, which is not a traumatic intervention, uh, but is hugely effective. And uh, I know that our consultants and others are looking at uh, the possibility that at some time they could do it for stroke interventions as well. And that would have a massive impact if we ever got to that point. But at this moment in time, uh, people who suffer from what is described as STEMI heart attacks, in other words, a clot, uh, or which is either a blood clot or, or a piece of fat, which people have generally brought upon themselves through eating the wrong foods. Uh, if that is a, a, in their bloodstream, the, we have the ability to remove that and remove it very effectively if we get the person to the hospital in time. And by do, setting it up in Alton Gelvin and, and, and Royal Victoria Hospital, we will be able to get people to hospital very, very quickly. Katrina Ra. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And the question I have for the Minister is, um, given the recent report of the College of Emergency Medicine, how will the Minister respond to the recommendations? Yeah, I had a look at the, at the report in the College of Emergency Medicine, and it certainly um, wasn't the negative report that was reported in the press and media, uh, and it identified that there was a lot of good things happening. Uh, in our emergency departments. W what the report did identify was that right across the United Kingdom, uh, uh, and indeed beyond, but right across the United Kingdom, the, the, there is a problem with getting emergency medicine consultants. And I do think that that's something that the Royal Colleges in particular need to look at as to how we can ensure that there is adequate uh, emergency medicine consultants, registrars and doctors available uh, to carry out the care. Uh, I think that many of the, the things that we have done uh, will help us make best use um, of uh, the, the available resources. 
And certainly, whilst many people criticised us whenever uh, the city hospital uh, closed initially, uh, I think people do recognise that you're better to have your consultants where you have such close, close proximity, uh, based on the one site where they can support each other, provide cover for each other, and ensure that there is adequate cover uh, on a 24/7 basis. Well, the minister may or may not be aware. There's 10 different recommendations. And um, given the 10 recommendations, I wonder would he outline what additional resources, because um, we want to see safety for our patients uh, right across the island of Ireland and indeed in this part of Ireland as well. So could the Minister let me know what additional resources he's going to provide uh, to the hospital to ensure that they can fulfil these recommendations? Well, in, in terms of the, the Belfast Trust uh, Emergency Department, um, attendances, for example, uh, in September uh, 2013 uh, was 7,700. And uh, for those who had to wait for more than 12 hours, uh, that was two people. So we can see that uh, it, it is working uh, quite well in terms of its turnaround. In terms of safety and performance, I think it is recognised that that, that is something uh, which is very good in, in, in the Royal Victoria Hospital, indeed across our hospital sites. Uh, whenever you talk about the resources, we have ensured that we have supported additional nurses um, across the system. We are very keen to support all of the hospitals who are looking for additional consultants, and Alton Gelfin is an area which um, is struggling to get uh, those additional consultants. But nonetheless, we as a department are supporting the trusts in identifying um, consultants uh, and having those, those people there and having that quality of uh, medical resource uh, to carry out uh, the necessary performance. I think there's actually a lot of good news stories um, on emergency department. I think that Antrim Hospital, uh, whenever I came into office, was constantly in the headlines, and you're not hearing it now, because considerably good work has been done uh, by the people, by the management, by the staff, the doctors, the nurses, and everyone else, uh, to ensure that they are turning that facility around and, and using it well. Anna Lowe. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, can I ask the Minister for an assurance that 5N, the medical assessment unit in the Belfast City Hospital, will remain open and not only that, be also further developed? Well, the medical assessment unit works well in conjunction with the emergency department in the Royal Victoria Hospital. And the medical assessment unit is, enables us to actually take in people uh, where the city hospital specialises uh, and, and do that in, in, in a way which uh, is very convenient for, for the public uh, and uh, causes less trauma for the individual who is actually receiving care, and that is important. Uh, so I have not heard anything at the medical assessment doing there is any threat on it. No one has mentioned that to me. Uh, the member may have heard something different. Uh, but as far as I'm concerned, the medical assessment unit is working well and, as, uh, uh, to the best of my knowledge, will continue to be the case for the future. Anna Lowe. Well, thank the Minister for his assurance. Uh, does the Minister agree that 5N not only provides very necessary, rapid, targeted early intervention for patients, especially older <laughs> people, but also that it reduces overcrowding? in a and &E in keeping with the aims of trans uh, transforming your care. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. D direct admission, obviously, to, to key wards like that that are very, very important. And uh, if GPs can refer people to medical assessment units and avoid emergency departments with uh, all of the others who, who are in those emergency departments, particularly for older people, because, um, as we know, the city hospital does specialise in, in, in urology, for example, an awful lot of older people um, will have infections uh, in their bladders and so forth. And it's very, very important um, that we can treat those people with dignity, with respect. That isn't always the case in the health service, I have to say, but we need to ensure that it is the case um, as, as often as it's possible to be. And I would like it to always be the case that they're treated with respect and dignity. And uh, as, as far as I can see, uh, people who go through that system, through that medical assessment unit um, and into the city hospital, I get very, very positive feedback on that particular facility. Uh, Trevor Long. Mr. Long. Yes, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask the Minister, given his particular responsibilities that he has, does he still hold the view expressed by himself and by other party members that homosexuality is an illness treated by, treatable by medical or psychiatric means? I don't think that uh, I ever did say that. 
Trevor Long. Uh, I'll, I'll try and find a reference for him, but uh, I'll just ask him the same question again. Does he, does he think that homosexuality is an illness treatable by medical or psychiatric means, or does he indeed think that, that as has been expressed by another member of his party, it's actually an abomination? Well, uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Speaker, in terms of, of these issues, no, I don't think uh, it is an illness in the first instance. Um, I do think that many people have uh, various uh, elements to their lives um, that, when it comes to sexuality, uh, many people who are heterosexual uh, would desire uh, to, to uh, desire lots of other folks. Those of us, those of us who are married shouldn't, shouldn't be doing that. So uh, people can resist urges. And uh, in terms of all of this, uh, I would just encourage people uh, to take a sensible and rational view on these issues. Uh, I know that there's been a number of challenges about me and about various stances that I take. Uh, I'll make it very clear that in terms of blood safety, um, that is purely about safety. Uh, when it comes to adoption, I'm just coming from a, 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 an MLU, a middle free led unit in Lagan Valley today, and uh, all of the people that were giving birth in that unit were women. And all of, the, all of those women um, would not have been impregnated by another woman. So the natural order, whether one, one believes in God or whether one believes in evolution, the natural order is for a man and a woman to have a child. And therefore, that uh, has uh, made my views on adoption very, very clear, and on raising children very, very clear, that it should be a man and a woman that raises a child. Now, people can criticise me for that, and they can challenge me for it, and they can say it's backward. Uh, the truth is that still today, in this modern era, it is only a man and a woman that can produce a child. And therefore, I think that it's in the best order for a man and a woman to raise a child. Order, order. Adrian McQuillan. Mr. McQuillan. Peter, can I ask the Minister for his assessment of the report by the Economy and Jobs Initiative uh, Task and Finish Group? Yeah, that, that particular piece of work uh, has, has run on from Connected Health uh, in terms of the work that our department does uh, with the Department of Enterprise, Trade and Investment. Uh, and what we want to do is to ensure that every opportunity is taken. Uh, to enable us to maximise uh, the, the benefits to our economy uh, associated with our health care. So health care accounts for <coughs> around 10% of jobs in Northern Ireland, about 9% of spend in Northern Ireland, and uh, therefore it's very, very important that we identify how best we can use that resource, how we can encourage that resource to be spent max to maximise the spend that actually happens in Northern Ireland uh, in terms of development of drugs, of procedures, uh, the development of innovation, uh, that, that a lot of that takes place in Northern Ireland. So we have uh, done a lot of work in this. We have established an ecosystem which will involve the universities, the health and social care trusts, uh, and indeed it will involve the business sector. And it is looked upon quite enviously by others, um, lots of other bigger areas. Uh, I'm currently in, in negotiations uh, with the State of New York, for example, uh, on a memorandum of understanding on these issues. Uh, we have got reference three status in the European Union, uh, three star status, which is the highest status that has been awarded uh, thus far. Thirteen countries or regions fitted into it. Northern Ireland is one of those. Uh, and we are making huge progress on this front. And Northern Ireland is being seen as a place, both in Europe and the United States of America as being hugely progressive. Uh, I think sometimes our media want us to be demonstrated as a place that is backward and regressive, whenever actually others are looking to us and saying Northern Ireland is leading the way. Yeah. Members, that concludes topical questions. The Minister of Health, we now move.